The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to The David Pakman Show. Hi to everyone who's watching us live on YouTube every Monday through Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Lewis, including everybody from the I Love It When I Wake Up in the Morning and Barack Obama is President page as well as the We Survive Bush, You'll Survive Obama Facebook page. It is the day before Thanksgiving, which is the day before Black Friday, which is the day before Small Business Saturday. So I want to mention that we've got a great way for you to become a David Pakman Show member, get one of our new hoodies or zip-up hoodies made from recycled materials, save a bunch of money, and support a small business, which is you go to davidpakman.com slash Black Friday. This is already up and running. You can wait till Black Friday if you want. You can wait till Small Business Saturday if you want. Or you can, maybe if you're bored on Thanksgiving, you wait until then. But it is wide open, davidpackman.com slash Black Friday. Membership for a year, plus the hoodie of your choice, color, size, style of your choice. Uh, about 30% off. Big time stuff, Lewis. Excellent deal. As of this minute, we have now gotten the ceasefire agreement conditions in our hands that is effective right now in Israel and Gaza. Uh, Ahead of the ceasefire, we saw uh, uh, the Israeli Air Force continuing to carry out airstrikes on Gaza. We saw Gaza terrorists continuing to send rockets into southern Israel right up until the last minute, Lewis, as often is the case. We now have in front of us the stipulations of the ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Number 1A is that Israel will stop all hostilities on the Gaza Strip land, sea, and air, including incursions and including specific targeting of individuals. And 1B, all Palestinian factions shall stop all hostilities against Israel, including rocket attacks and attacks along the border. Now, question was, what about the blockade? Uh, Yesterday or the day before, I was very clear that the blockade will be an impediment to progress. The blockade needs to be resolved. While I understand some of the reasons that those on the Israeli side believe the blockade needs to be there, we can't have a blockade and really argue that we have an even playing field for true progress. Would you agree with that, Lewis? I would agree, but you know, there's there's still a border there. So you're still, I mean, it's not like there's going to be free passage. No, but there's a difference but, between a blockade and right, a border. Right? right. We need to, certainly some nuance is, is necessary there. So, uh, Natan, what we see in the uh, agreement is opening the crossings and facilitating the movement of people and transfer of goods and refraining from restrict, restricting residents' free movement and targeting residents in border areas and procedures of implementation shall be dealt with within 24 hours from the start of the ceasefire. Meaning right now we have 23 hours and 57 minutes for that to be, uh, quote, dealt with. What can we expect, Natan, in terms of how that blockade will be dealt with? Well, um, so this isn't um, that the blockade will be uh, eliminated. No, it it is not. It's that it will be dealt with. Yeah, there's going to be some freeing up of restrictions. Hopefully they can allow uh, aid to get in, food to get in, and not allow rocket materials to get in. Right. Uh, We'll see how that goes. So do you think, Lewis, that there is going to be any kind of dealing with, to use the language here, that this could be dealt with in any way? Some say a good compromise leaves all sides unhappy, okay? But do you believe that there will be any dealing with the blockade such that both sides will at least consider it a valid premise on which to further negotiations? Or is that even too much to expect? Are you asking me if it's possible or if if what we can expect to happen? What we can expect. Uh, I'd like to be more optimistic, but uh, I'm not. I'm not. My, My expectation is that there will be some kind of a dealing with the blockade such that Israel will be concerned that they are giving up too much in terms of security. Security. And that the Palestinian side believes that not enough is being given in terms of how movement is, is being freed up. That's my, my expectation is we're going to have more or less a zero sum in terms of the effect on negotiating, uh, d- you know, how dis- d- disposed people are to negotiate. Right. Same here. Um, let's talk briefly. I got a lot of emails. The anti-Semitic emails continue to pour in. The emails that I'm deliberately hiding or occulting or doing all sorts of evil stuff because I am Jewish and a Zionist and would choose Israel over the U.S. in a fictional war, those are continuing to pour in at the rate of probably 50 per per hour, okay? Putting those aside, 
I've been asked specifically to address the idea that Benjamin Netanyahu benefits politically from continuing violence there and that he has kind of a vested interest politically in continuing this. Now, in the research I've done does not find evidence of that in the sense that if people say electorally th it, it, he's likely to do better, it's possible that, his, that he would do a couple of points better, but correct me if I'm wrong, Natan, Benjamin Netanyahu was set to do very well in upcoming elections regardless. I mean, the truth is, if you um, a priori, like before even anything happens, just have the idea that whatever Israel does is only done for political reasons. The truth is, every government in the entire world has political considerations. Having said that, like you're saying, there doesn't seem to be a great immediate or even median term benefit to this because they were already polling pretty highly and they were probably going to win a pretty broad coalition in February. So. I don't think that uh, it's reasonable or balanced at all to go into this uh, conflict thinking that. Okay, Lewis, you want to add anything? Uh, not much. No, it seems he has uh, a lot of support across the board. I, like Natan said, there were always political decisions, but uh, I wouldn't say those influ influence him as much now as say uh, when the, some of the things Obama did in his last term. I want to talk about this upcoming Walmart strike that has been in the news, and I want to talk about media bias. We're about to do a really good case study here on media bias. Now, the backstory is that large groups of labor and community workers are preparing to hold a huge Black Friday protest at a lot of Walmart locations across, uh, really across the country, okay? And um, this includes he here in Massachusetts, actually, Lewis, interestingly enough, involved with Jobs with Justice, which is a group that's in the area. And workers began taking action at warehouses and retail stores last month, speaking out against low wages, speaking out against what they call unsafe working conditions and Walmart's attempts to, quote, slice workers' voices on the jobs when it comes to being able to organize a union or, or go against these conditions. And strikes have reportedly already taken place in California, Washington, and Texas so far. So let's get to the media bias analysis. I think you're going to like this. Walmart spokesman David Tovar has been doing the media rounds, okay? My, I don't know if I'm right about this, but my sense is that at Walmart headquarters in uh, Arkansas, they actually have a satellite set up and, and they're able to basically patch in David Tovar into any of the news networks the same way, you know, like when I'm on current TV, I go to a news station. Walmart's got that all set up. Certainly they can afford it. So David Tovar, their spokesman, starts doing different media appearances. So the first media appearance I'm going to play for you is on CNN. David Tovar was interviewed by Carol Costello. I'm no big fan of Carol Costello. I think she's just kind of a you know, mediocre news person. However, she brought up good questions about, can we address the Walmart poverty level wages? In other words, that people are making $15,000 a year. They are considered, quote, full time, but they're just not making enough money to live on. This interview bit is being called biased by the right, indicating that she is having anti-big corporation bias by asking these questions, and that Carol Costello is evidence that CNN is just a left-wing media outlet. Let's take a listen. We'll analyze. Its ability to make sure its employees can support a strong middle-class lifestyle. I mean, we're working hard every day to provide more opportunities for associates. I mean, go back to some of the things I said to you earlier about you know but how people making, advance within if, our within our company. If a lot company. of making fifteen thousand dollars a year, you can't live a strong middle-class lifestyle on that. You just can't. Right, but our jobs are, like I said, are some of the best jobs in the retail industry. I, I, I would, Even I would the ones uh, challenge that the numbers that you gave, about $15,000. Well, what's an average salary you know, our, for our Walmart average wage, our, our average wage is about $12.40 an hour for a full-time associate. We also uh, offer ben, um, uh, comprehensive benefits packages as low as $17 a pay period, which is very affordable. Um, we also pay quarterly bonuses, which is something that not a lot of retailers do. And just this past quarter, 82% of eligible associates received a bonus. Um, and we know that they appreciate that. They also get a 10% discount card. So you have to Okay, so let's analyze this. That is being called by the right ambush journalism, all sorts of stuff. Now, what do I see there? I see the tiniest bit of resistance from Carol Costello and asking a real question. And then I see David Tobar un unchallenged, citing this statistic that the average full-timer makes twelve forty an hour, not mentioning, wait a second, that's counting executive salaries averaged out 
into that. The, the average actual store person, and taking into consideration that the store manager makes a lot of money, a lot of Walmart store, store managers, managers make a lot of money. six figures. If you average that in, yes, you get 1240, but it's not realistic. The mean is not representative of the median in this case. Right. And on Nor top of, of the that, mode. On top of that, he's talking about these bonuses that are handed out. Well, those bonuses go to the store managers right. only. Who are already making tons of money? Employees do get some b b b bonuses, but Negligible. it's fractional. It's Negligible. fractional, the, exactly. The, the the store managers can get massive bonuses based on how well their stores do in a given month or quarter. So that is being called by the right liberal media bias. Let me play for you, David Tovar, same spokesman, being interviewed on Fox News by Stuart Varney, known anti-union crusader Stuart Varney, and pay attention specifically to the questions that Stuart Varney asks. And you tell me what's biased. Let's take a listen, Lewis. Walmart's rolling back the prices and it's rolling up its sleeves in a major fight against the unions. On Black Friday, unions are planning to help Walmart workers stage a massive walkout, complete with flash mobs and justice-themed caroling. But Walmart is fighting back by filing a complaint against one of the biggest unions. David Tovar is Walmart's Vice President of Communications. David, you've taken on the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, I believe. You filed this complaint against them. Is that enough? to stop any walkout the day after Thanksgiving. Our viewers, maybe some Walmart shoppers, they want to know, are they going to hit these, uh, these roadblocks? Okay, so there's question number one. What about the shoppers? Will they be able to shop? Let's move ahead, Lewis, to well, some of the next questions that he asked. Uh, let me see if I can find, here we go. They're doing your best for Walmart. These are on Black Friday, and we think it's going to be an awesome day at Walmart yeah. this year. I mean, David, I got it. I, I know you're, do you're out there doing your best for Walmart, but look, can you stop these protests? <laughs> well, this complaint, this labor... Again, listen, I know you're talking about what's best for, wa for Walmart, but can you stop these evil protests, which I'm not even going to tell my audience why they're protesting. That's completely missing from the discussion. And I'm going to keep serving up questions to you about how can we stop the protesters? This is how not... How do we fight you? Unions. How can we fight unions? Now, let me give you the list of questions that he followed up with. He asked whether Wal can Walmart sue the workers union? That's a hard hitting question from Stuart Varney. What can what can Walmart do? Can you can you sue the unions because the workers are striking and then going on and saying uh, if your workers walk off the job, will you fire them? What a great balanced supportive question given what's going on here and all of the ac allegations against Walmart. Brilliant question. And then would you agree that you're you're in for a tough four years because this administration, a.k.a. Obama, is no friend to Walmart. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is garbage. This is, the, this is a garbage interview. Stuart Varney is allowed to go out there and do this. this let, let me tee him up for you, David Tovar. And that apparently is journalism. And Carol Costello says, well, if someone makes 15 grand full time, they're not really living. That that, that's too far, guys. That's, that's liberal bias. Right. Uh, why, why can't you, why are you automatically targeted by either side for asking tough questions? I mean, don't we want tough questions asked? Exactly. That's, Isn't that's, that good journalism? And, just, and the, the Stuart Varney questions just weren't tough. They just weren't tough. That's I mean, even even um, Carol Costello, she didn't really follow up with no. the same things we said. That's the Had thing. Had she done that. Even Carol Costello was basically crumbling under talking points from right. Walmart. And she was... She, she, <laughs> totally the, crumbled under talking the points. The skewed nature of this, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to fix what's going on. One more Walmart-related thing. Stuart Varney being interviewed as a guest by Megyn Kelly. He brought up this unsourced... Well, it wasn't unsourced. It was just unbacked thing from the Daily Caller suggesting that George Soros is backing the protests, the, the Walmart protests. Here's that video. Take a look at this. Possibly means that the end be, will I not apologize, be able I can't full screen this, but take a listen. ...that take place uh, in uh, Walmart on Friday. That development is George Soros, through moveon.org, <laughs> has sent out an email nationwide urging everybody who has an interest in this to turn up at a Walmart on Friday and demonstrate. Okay, so again, Smear journalism. This is not real stuff. What's the reality? George Soros uh, gave about a million and a half dollars to MoveOn.org eight years ago. MoveOn.org has received no donations from him since. Soros is not a current member of MoveOn.org. 
And the email had absolutely nothing to do with George Soros. Now, the Daily Caller did go back and remove all references to Soros from their article, of course, because it was completely wrong, and added a note saying an earlier version connected George Soros to this. There is no apparent connection currently. That's what we're dealing with, ladies and gentlemen. And if you sit back and watch five minutes of this and aren't questioning it, we're in big trouble because the amount of straight up lying that's going on is insane right now. Unfortunately, most people will just listen to whatever's said on these mainstream networks and completely take it at face value. It, uh, no question about it. One quick story before we take a break, the latest from Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson, since we are getting into the holiday season, says atheists are miserable and trying to steal Christmas kind of like the Grinch. Let's take a listen to that incredible analysis. Pat? Well, it's, well, Christmas all over again. Um, the Grinch is trying to steal our holiday. It's been so beautiful. The nation comes together. We sing Christmas carols. We give gifts to each other. Uh, we have uh, lighted trees, and it's just a beautiful thing. Atheists don't like our happiness. They don't want you to be happy. They want you to be miserable. They're miserable, so they want you to be miserable. Yeah. So they want to steal your holiday away from you. There you Terror. go. Okay, so brilliant analysis. Do you know any atheists that are miserable? And, for, and, and, and number, number one, and number two, if they are, can you attribute their misery to being atheists? Hard to say. <laughs> Impossible to prove. Natan, what's your reaction to Pat Robertson? Is this just, uh, to, to quote Brian Williams, he's, pa he's t passing the last exit on the road to relevance or something like that? You know, I guess my reaction is I would rather be miserable and right. Okay, well, so there you go. Even if they are miserable, and even if they are miserable because they are atheists, at least they are right about something. They're miserable because they're... Their friends and relatives celebrate Christmas and they get sucked <laughs> into it. That's a good point. Maybe it's, they're miserable because of people like Pat Robertson. That's a good point. Yeah. Hey, if you don't get the bonus show, sign up for membership. Get the bonus show. On today's bonus show, we'll be talking about the public urination, three-year-old, $2,500 ticket follow-up. We'll also talk about some outrageous claims about meat eating in some Indian textbooks. And we'll talk about the New York Police Department cannibal cop and plenty more. Go to davidpackman.com slash membership. Sign up. Plenty of stuff coming up on this day before Thanksgiving. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. The holiday buying season is ramping up. Please remember, if you use Amazon.com for any purchases, first, before making your purchases, go to our website, davidpakman.com, click on the black banner on the right side of the website that links to Amazon, bookmark it, and use that bookmark whenever you shop. Just doing that will send 7% of your purchase to the show instead of to Amazon.com. Also, you can become a David Pakman Show member, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Liberal bias is found in the most amazing places, as Lewis knows. Even single-celled organisms like yeast can be built guilty of liberal bias. Find out about that and more at liberalbias.com. Today's new David Pakman Show member of the day is Thomas Kavanaugh. Thomas Kavanaugh, fantastic to have him aboard. Of course. Thanks to all David Pakman Show members. Let's go through a few stories that have been uh, kind of piling up here. The Alan West election recount situation. Alan West has finally conceded. And this is so funny. He conceded to Democratic challenger Patrick Murphy. I like this on a number of levels. Number one, I like it because anytime these one term right wing uh, conservatives get elected and then immediately booted out really confirms the fluke nature of their election. Scott Brown in Massachusetts in the Senate didn't even get to serve a full term. He was elected in a special election. So Alan West is out. But what's even funnier? Funniest thing is that after harping on all of the election fraud that took place and the irregularities after the recount he actually trailed by an additional 300 votes to patrick murphy gotta love it that's great isn't it ironic natan yeah although i will say that uh if the recounts had gone on statewide in florida in 2000 it is perfectly possible for bush to have won anyway because a lot of the votes that would have gone to gore had already been thrown out prior to the recount 
and wouldn't have been counted for either candidate. So he could keep on making the sort of voter suppression argument, but I sure. don't think it flies. It just seems in this particular case that there are no missing votes. There's no other allegations. It's just he, he just didn't win. Right. And okay. it's great to see him go. It is great to see him go. John McCain. John McCain, along with Senator Lindsey Graham, both Republicans, have been going on this proverbial witch hunt against the Obama administration and uh, Susan Rice, claiming that the administration was deliberately misleading the public about the nature of the Benghazi consulate attacks. Now, Senator John McCain has gone as far as to say we need a select committee and we need to figure out what was the quote, Natan? He wants to know who changed the talking points. That was his, that was his quote. Yeah, he's very concerned about the talking points and, and where they went and <laughs> where, where they were stored <laughs> and how they were changed. Right. So a lot of questions about the talking points. So now he basically issued a statement conceding he was wrong in accusing the, the White House of changing U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice's talking points on Benghazi for political purposes. David Petraeus told lawmakers last week that the CIA's assessment that Al Qaeda was responsible for the September 11th attack that killed the four Americans in Benghazi was taken out of Rice's talking points after an interagency review. McCain and his allies then went on to claim the White House took out the talking points because it was going to undercut the Obama administration's narrative that it had weakened Al Qaeda. Intelligence officials told CNN that the intelligence community was responsible for the changes made to Rice's talking points and that the White House just was not involved in the changes. So McCain responded and instead of taking issue with the substance of the report, he basically just said, uh, why did administration and intelligence officials not tell us this in closed door sessions? So now the issue for McCain is, well, we should have been told sooner about that. But he's basically conceding that the, the entire thing was bogus. There's no conspiracy at all after conservative media and a handful of Republicans were saying, huge conspiracy here. Well, of course, it was uh, the election was coming up and they thought it was it was going to help their candidate. I mean, what's the point of talking about it now? Obama won again. You can just drop it. McCain has said that he would block the nomination of Susan Rice for secretary of state if she were to be nominated. And he, he said, quote, I would do everything in my power to block her and that she's not qualified for her for, for that position and that she, quote, should have known better. And I think it's fascinating that John McCain thinks that Rhodes Scholar and Oxford PhD Susan Rice is unqualified as potential secretary of state, given that he thought presumably that Sarah Palin was qualified to be the vice president. <laughs> I mean, who, John, I think John McCain is not qualified to speak about people's qualifications. After the Palin incident, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Disqualified. No question about it. What's happened to John McCain? It's a little sad, I feel like, what's happened to him. He just seems so bitter. Do you, do you date this back to losing to Obama in tw 2008? That seemed to be the start of it, mm. right? Yeah. It's too let's bad. Not for, let's not forget that in 2000, Ted Kennedy almost convinced John McCain to become a Democrat. Yeah. So what we're talking about a bipartisan guy, you know, a pretty moderate guy who since 2008 has gone on an old, angry man streak. He's, he's uh, suffered a fundamental paradigm, sh paradigm shift. Exactly. You're right. Imagine this. You're an anti-gay lawyer and you get, uh, you're in court being indicted for child pornography. That's bad enough. All of a sudden, while you're in court for the child porn, federal agents come in and subsequently arrest you for underage sex charges, child molestation involving taking a young, young girl across the border into Canada and forcing her to have sex with you and filming it. That's a bad day. That's a pretty bad day. Yeah, this is, of course, Lisa Byron, a Manchester, New Hampshire lawyer. She's affiliated with an anti-gay group uh, that I will tell you about called the Alliance for Defending Freedom. She's accused of transporting a girl into Canada, coercing her into sex, filming it. She took the teenager across the border while on bail for child porn charges. She was arrested in court by the FBI as she was awaiting district level hearing for the child porn. Initially, she was held after police found porn material on her computer. She was arrested uh, then uh, Friday during a hearing to, t to discuss whether she would be brought up on those charges. And then now it's, it's clearly gotten much, much worse. Things keep getting even worse. Like, how could it really even get worse? It's gotten even worse. Police also found 200 rounds of ammunition in Byron's home. And she allegedly threatened the person who told the police about the porn. And two witnesses say they uh, claim they saw her with marijuana, ecstasy, and cocaine. <laughs> you know, 
This would be bad enough, just anti-gay lawyer caught with child porn. And then it would be bad enough if it was anti-gay lawyer already caught with child porn, now charged with child molestation and underage coercive uh, uh, rape, essentially. I guarantee you we haven't heard the end of this. That would be bad enough. But then it would have been bad enough. It was also she was found with ammunition and was uh, 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 allegedly threatening the person who turned her in for the porn. That would have been bad enough. But then she's also been found with marijuana, ecstasy, and cocaine. So we're digging the hole pretty deep here. Yes, I I'm sure there were probably other children who were molested by her. You would have to assume. We have no evidence, but rarely are people caught on the first time they do something like this. Right. That, that's certainly true. Or, or there's, there's many people who aren't, I guess is what we can say. Yeah. Now, I, wanna, I know everybody's very concerned about this. So I want to make a very clear statement, Lewis. Don't worry. This woman is pro-family. And she will save pr plenty of families by preventing gay adoptions through legal legal uh, recourse. So uh, don't worry. I know that she had the child porn and that she took a girl across the border to Canada and forced her to have sex. And she, she has cocaine and all sorts of stuff. She's pro-family. She's a Christian. Everything's going to be fine. I know that all the Bible thumpers are so glad that they've got a soldier like her on their side. Now, was she born a hypocritical pervert or is that a lifestyle choice? That's really the question I want to know. Well, let's not get into that. No, and actually, it's kind of a serious question because... Because chances are you are born of... A, much mental yeah, illness yeah. is hereditary. Right. Yeah. No, or not hereditary, but in other words, uh, you are born with right. genetic. Yeah. The Michigan Republican Party... Oh, this is, this is incredible, but brace yourselves for this. The Michigan Republican Party wants to give a tax break to fetuses. Yeah. One of the jokes I've often made about these personhood amendments is if a fertilized egg is a person you should be able to claim them on your taxes, right? Right. It's no longer a joke. Now it's for real. Michigan Republicans are pushing a bill that would grant a tax credit to any fetus proven to be at least 12 weeks along by December 31st. Then you would be able to claim that uh, on, your, on your taxes uh, for that year when you file them after the new year. They're calling it an advance on the actual tax break the family would receive in the following can uh, calendar year. The GOP is basically framing this as a chance to offset expenses with pregnancy. Hey, at least they're consistent, right? They say it's a person and now you get a tax credit as if it were a person. The only problem is that Michigan slashed the actual child tax credit last year. So what do we have here? More protection for children until they are born. Tax credit after you've been birthed goes down. In addition, of course, Republicans want to continue cutting social services and all sorts of programs that benefit children after they've been born. It seems counterproductive. I mean, if, if what they're trying to do is not give money or let, allow people to save money, then you would think that they'd be all about abortions. You, you, well, th that's the thing. That requires logic and thinking. Legal and safe access to abortion does a number of, of different things. Uh, number one, it uh, reduces the number of people who are on welfare, as we know on that story we did yesterday, where when women are denied abortions, they end up much more likely to be on welfare and social assistance. The children do better. We know all this stuff. And even if we go further back, trying to prevent birth control, birth control drastically reduces the number of abortions that even come up because there's less people that are pregnant. That's logic, though, Lewis. That's tainted we can't by let logic get in the way of our agenda. It's tainted by liberal bias, of right. course. Let's take a break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman Show. Join us on Facebook. We'll take a break. We'll be back. A lot more to talk about. Day before, day before Thanksgiving. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Joining us one day early because of the Thanksgiving holiday is Dennis Campbell for Worldview with Dennis Campbell. He's editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine. The book is Billionaire Boy's Election Freak Show. Dennis, I've always had this weird situation around Thanksgiving. Actually, it's really around all holidays because being from Argentina, my family never did anything on Thanksgiving. It was just a very boring day for me. And then on Christmas, because I'm Jewish, I did nothing. I would, you know, order Chinese food and or go to the movies. So for me, I feel like I've always been celebrating holidays in a kind of foreign country. What do people who are American but live in Europe do on Thanksgiving? 
Well, Thanksgiving, interestingly enough, is the one day when we all manage to come together, that the people that are Americans abroad. Uh, this will be the second time that I've attended the uh, American uh, expat meetup group in, in Cardiff. And at the University of Cardiff, they lay on a nice traditional Thanksgiving feast for everybody. Uh, they have a lot of people that are there on a more or less temporary assignment, uh, you know, as professors, etc. But uh, it's really a very, very nice thing to be a part of. They, you know, have the turkey and the stuffings and all the uh, the normal things. But when I first arrived here 15 years ago in Europe, uh, it was very strange not to have the traditional Thanksgiving dinner and family around. It was just another Thursday. Indeed, it was another work day. So for a lot of people, the holidays are completely turned upside down. Uh, I stop wearing white after uh, Labor Day. On uh, Independence Day, I'll go down to Cardiff Bay and toss in a tea bag, although that now has a, a different uh, a different connotation with the, the rise of the tea bag party. But, uh, right. you know, our holidays tend to follow, you know, the traditions of wherever we're living. When I lived in the Netherlands, we had Queen's Day. That was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of uh, parties and, and get-togethers for that. Here it's Guy Fawkes Day on the 5th of November celebrating the gunpowder plot and his attempt to blow up Parliament. So, yeah, holidays so like, do, do, you, do you actually feel connected to any of that stuff? Because now, you know, uh, for example, now my girlfriend's family is American, right? So on Thanksgiving, I'll hang out with them and they do a Thanksgiving thing. But I, 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 I enjoy the social aspect of it. But it's really hard for me to really feel connected to it, even though I'm an American citizen. I've been living here at this point, you know, well more than 20 years. Do you, do you feel any connection to those other holidays? I do. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, with my wife's family, what we, what we do is, is we'll, we'll spend the week after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, with her family in the Netherlands. We'll take the kids over as well. And, you know, they have a very strong tradition around New Year's that's very similar to what we do at Halloween. On New Year's Day, you go around and you visit with, uh, you know, other friends and neighbors and ask for candies and treats, very similar to what American children do on Halloween. The second uh, day of Christmas is actually called Tveda Kerstdag, or the second Christmas day. Here it's Boxing Day, is also a national holiday, and it's just a time for being around family. And there are lots of different foods that are also created. What's the most unusual or, or different holiday or, or holiday celebration that you've encountered around the world? Well, I have to say that, you know, the, the tradition of blowing up lots of fireworks on New Year's Eve is something I was not used to living in the States. It's something where I think they uh, estimated it was about 100 million euros worth of fireworks in the Netherlands and about the same amount in pounds here get blown up between midnight and 15 minutes after the hour. And every store you go into has fireworks for sale. And that takes a bit of getting used to. Yeah, especially when here in the U.S., I don't know the state-by-state -state rules. I know here in Massachusetts, people drive up to New Hampshire to buy them, but then it's still illegal to have them in Massachusetts. It's a very complicated fireworks situation here. It is, and, and you know, it, it is really, um, you know, part of, of, of celebrating the fact that the new year has come in, but, you know, the pall of smoke that falls over everyone's house is also not quite so much fun. But I really think the most important thing, particularly as we approach this Thanksgiving holiday, is to do a little bit of healing. I, I, I've seen a lot of a very nasty dialogue between all the parties that were involved in this election, and it continues to this <laughs> yeah. day. And I have a friend who's, who's going through some very difficult times that we've been, uh, he, he's actually a, a co-contributor here at, at, at UK Progressive. We've done some fundraising for him because he's in a homeless situation. And some of the things that are written in comments are just absolutely brutal. And it would be nice to see if for, for at least for Thanksgiving, for this period, we could find a way to now begin to disagree, but without becoming disagreeable. I think we now need to change a lot of the way in which we speak about each other going forward. And that would be my Thanksgiving wish. And I wish you and Lewis and Vatan the, the very best of the holiday seasons and all of your viewers and thank them for supporting this segment as they have throughout the entire year. And thank you as well. Absolutely. And also, this is probably a good opportunity to mention how is Movember going? Well, <laughs> Movember's going okay. 
Uh, the hair is, is, is quite itchy. We've, we've raised a, a few hundred dollars in, in funds, but obviously there's still uh, 11 days to go here. Uh, it's going to get a little bit more gruesome in the last two segments or the last segment that you and I will do. And uh, I cannot wait to shave. I've never, I've never been in a situation where getting rid of this thing would be wonderful, but it is for a very good cause. And uh, again, I thank you for, for all you've done to put the, the link in and to, to make people aware prostate cancer is, is such a horrible disease and, and it can spread so quickly to other parts of the body if we can get some of the new technology, the robotic technology, and it will really help uh, a number of people going forward. Right. So we'll put the, the link to your Indiegogo fundraiser. Please contribute to Dennis's fundraiser. I actually realized I, I last shaved like on the 3rd of November and I haven't since then. It's just that my beard grows so pathetically slow that it's not really that visible, but I've essentially not shaved all of November at this point. It's, it's uh, quite so an embarrassing in situation. So you're as well, so that's great. Yeah. All right, Dennis Campbell, editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine. Check out the Indiegogo fundraiser for prostate cancer research. Thanks as always, Dennis. We'll talk to you after Thanksgiving. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. All right, same to you. We'll take a break. Back with plenty more after this. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Please support The David Pakman Show by becoming a David Pakman Show member for Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Small Business Saturday. We've got a great special going on, great way to support our small business. Go to davidpakman.com slash Black Friday. You'll get a one-year membership plus the hoodie of your choice made from 100% recycled materials at a great discount. Check it out, davidpakman.com slash Black Friday. Here's an interesting story. Ecstasy-assisted psychotherapy is showing promising resu results for treating PTSD. Now, for some people, this isn't an interesting article at all, at all, because they say back in the 1950s, we already started seeing testing along these lines, and it was clear right away that ecstasy was useful along those lines. Now, uh, ecstasy was popularized during the 90s, mostly through the rave culture, and it really does seem like there are valid psychological science applications. Had you heard of this, Lewis? Yes, I've heard that there are some possible medical uses for this. Um, but basically what they're talking about is just the active ingredient in ecstasy, right? Right. We're really talking about MDMA, which is known for its empathogenic effect. The drug shows uh, that it, it, it's been shown to increase feelings of empathy and social connection. You could certainly take that uh, quite a bit further. Oh, yeah. Um, along with producing feelings of euphoria and mild visual hallucination. So the idea is that psychotherapists can use this as a tool because it allows patients to engage traumatic memories without becoming overwhelmed with the fear and anxiety that are often involved, yet still going through the process of engaging, which is really necessary to, to start getting past the PTSD. Right. So th this is really pretty interesting. The way it would work is that during one of these MDMA-assisted sessions, the therapist would create a private, comfortable, and aesthetically pleasing setting for the participant to experience the drug. The participant, the patient, would consume the drug and then sit or lay down on the futon. They would be given eye shades, headphones with soothing music as well, hoping to have the participant direct their attention inward. And while experiencing the effects of the drug, the therapist would then encourage the participant to open up to feelings related to the trauma, explore how they are feeling, so on and so forth. And um, uh, now the only question is, if you have headphones on with soothing music, how can you have a discussion with the therapist? But maybe it's just at the beginning they have the soothing music and headphones. I don't get that part. Yeah, or that's just what they have on them while they're talking, and they just talk the whole process, everything that happened. Um, you can talk and not need to hear, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it is. Do you think there will be resistance to this type of thing, Natan, based on the, the so-called war on drugs? Is that going to be a factor to using something like this as treatment, per se? I think it shouldn't be because I think that the scientists that are finding this information out in studies like this know that uh, this drug is dangerous if taken in a high dose or if taken frequently. So it has to be clear that only in a supervised situation where you're doing it 
um, once or, or, or not often in order to get a specific safe result. Um, I, I certainly don't think that it should be extended to any uh, legal use beyond that. No, and I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, will, will there be resistance even to this use based on the dr war on drugs? There will be some resistance, but hopefully people can understand that in a medical setting, it'll be safe. You agree with that, Lewis? I believe there will be resistance, yeah, but I, I can only hope that people will see the light. Here's a new idea. Hmm. Botox to have a better poker face. Now, Lewis, you've played poker, I've played poker. The idea that you can hide... A tell, in other words, something that you may not be aware of, some kind of facial tick or movement that indicates whether you have a particularly good or bad hand. The idea is with Botox, you might be able to hide that essentially because Botox paralyzes muscles and reduces the movement. So you might be able to work with Dr. Jack Birdie, who is introducing poker tox and have him help you figure out what are your tells and where could you inject Botox to mitigate that or Here's the other idea. Where could you inject Botox to create a tell when there isn't one? Maybe to throw off your opponents. What do you think about this? I think it is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do too. And some I poker mean, players also agree it's ridiculous. Yes. I, I wonder if the people getting this even know what Botox is. Yeah, well, presumably the doctor would tell them. Here's a better idea to hide. Because I bet you if most people knew what Botox was, they wouldn't go near it. Here's a better idea for hiding your tells. What if you put... A, if you st uh, uh, basically get into a stacked up uh, vehicle tires so you're just not visible at all with the exception of just a hole cut in one so you can reach out and move your cards. Nobody would even be able to see you. Or even better, mummify yourself. Basically wrap yourself up like a mummy when you play poker and just sit at the table like that. Sounds a lot safer than Botox. You'll just have eye slits and then you can see your cards and then nobody can tell. Why can't people just do that? Yeah, it seems so much simpler and more logical to wrap yourself up like a mummy when you play poker than to inject uh, muscle paralyzers. Right. Okay, let's go to some of your voicemails. A lot of voicemails came in. 2192DAVIDP is our voicemail number. Call 24 hours a day. Here is one voicemail about what an individual who is 71 years old and watches the show, a liberal 71-year-old, is concerned about possible ageism for some comments that producer Lewis made. Are you ready to hear this, Lewis? I'm ready. Hi, David. Um, I suggest that... Uh, you think about this a little bit. Uh, just watch the creeping ageism. Uh, I'm 71. I'm a white male. I've been liberal all my adult life. I agree that troglodyte Republican thinking is aging out of the culture, but I have a problem with comments like the one I heard on your show about disabled kids being God's punishment for abortion. Your sidekick said most young people could look at this and think critically uh, about it, and think, wow, this is ridiculous. I'm never going to vote for someone who's insane like this. Well, it's not just young people who abjure insanity. I'm a non-theist, senior, white male liberal who's never going to vote for someone who's insane like this. Uh, would you say, quote, most women could look at this and think critically about it and think, wow, this is ridiculous. I'm never going to vote for someone who's insane like this, leaving men out of the mix? dare say. You know. All right, so I get the, the point he's making. Yeah, I think I was mis... Uh, I think your wording was wrong. I mean, certainly, yeah. uh, I, I, the voicemail is a good voicemail because it points out that the language used may not have been appropriate. Right. We were talking about how religion, the, the more religious types tend to be an older crowd. And or how in frame, but really even maybe that's wrong. What Maybe what we're really talking about is essentially the same thing, which is younger generations tend to be less and less religious. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's that's what I was talking Such about. Such that religious factors may not be as big of an influence on younger people. Right. But the point is absolutely clear. Old liberals, young liberals, middle-aged liberals, any I, it's Right. Uh, I I was not uh I was not trying to imply that. But very good voicemail because it's good yes. to be clear on that. I'm glad to have the opportunity that, to to explain it. Here's another voicemail. All right, the vo volume is down. Let's see if we can get that volume turned up. Here we go. Hi, David. David, I just wanted to thank you and the guys for being kind, being understanding, being open-minded, and having common sense. I'm 50 years old. I'm gay. All my life I've been terrorized by it, made fun of, put down, called a pervert, everything bad you could think of, and I'm bad about myself for years and years. And... Uh, I hear you on there, and you defend people that are gay, and you're right. We don't choose to be gay. We're born gay. Can't help it. 
God knows I tried 30 some years of my life to not be gay and it just can't be done. Absolutely. So great voicemail. Listen, we speak out wherever we believe speaking out needs to happen. The reality is, uh, 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 based on what the doctors tell me, uh, people are, uh, are just not choosing to be gay or straight. The fact that the right wing nuts can't answer that simple question when I ask them, when did you choose to be straight, is more confirmation that this is a ruse. Eventually, I think, Lewis, we will be completely past that. I don't know how long it will take, but for now, we have to do our best to challenge those ideas. We're making progress. DavidPackman.com slash Black Friday. Take advantage of our Black Friday promotion membership plus hoodie. We'll uh, see you after Thanksgiving. Have a great Thanksgiving. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.